non-agricultural audience in California, and that includes, you know, folks who do pest management for for their uh, their work um, and and residents and every everyone in between retail nurseries, um, structural pest control operators, um, and um, you know those who work with the general public. And so we we cover all the pests. Um, some of us specialize in entomology, some in weed science, verte uh, vertebrate pests, and um, plant pathology. I kind of uh, straddle a few of those. Um, and so I am also an area um, IPM advisor, so I serve my local communities in Sacramento, Solano, and Yolo counties. And so um, kind of a, a lot to tackle. Um, and so we're part of the uh, cooperative extension system with the um, Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, so as Chris just mentioned, right, we've heard a lot about glyphosate um, in the past uh, decade or so, and there have been many lawsuits and, you know, people changing their IPM plans and their IPM um, products for weed control due to um, findings and public perception. And so, you know, I don't think I have to explain this anymore, but people are looking for alternatives to um, to glyphosate. And as we realize that people are looking for alternatives, um, we we also realize we don't have a whole lot of information about the efficacy um, and, and other issues with some of the, the alternative products. And when I say alternative to glyphosate, um, there aren't really many products that do the same thing that glyphosate does. And so we're trying to find alternatives to it, but they're not necessarily glyphosate alternatives, if you if you see the, the difference. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we, um, we serve a number of um, what we call urban audiences, and it's urban, suburban, and rural, um, basically non-agricultural. And everyone's looking for um, either natural or organic or, you know, just non glyphosate ways to control their weeds, whether it's on a school campus um, and the parents are concerned or the, the school districts or the school staff. Um, and uh, this is this is both for for, um, you know, elementary and middle school, high school universities. Um, and so there's just a, a great need to find um, find out what these other products that are on the market, um, how, how well they work. So I always like to preface my talk to remind folks why we control weeds. While I'm sure everyone on this meeting knows why we control weeds, sometimes we have to talk to um, those who might question, well, why do you need to spray anything? Why do you need to do anything? Just, you know, it's natural. If they're plants, just let them grow. Well, weeds um, are weeds because we don't want them there. Um, and so um, having a very weedy area can um, diminish the aesthetics of a place. Um, uh, weeds can trap trash and kind of lead to sort of uh, the the feeling of urban decay or or an unkempt um, campus or a parking lot or area. And that's most likely not desirable to um, the folks that that are in the area. Uh, weeds can be a safety concern and also lead to economic um, issues. Uh, so, you know, the picture on the left there, weeds can go, grow through our asphalt and concrete and through cracks, and that can be um, a safety hazard for, for tripping um, and for, you know, moving equipment or, or other, other issues. Um, we see in the middle picture that um, tall weeds can um, uh, reduce our ability to see at intersections and um, stop signs, and that can be a safety concern for pedestrians, other cars coming by, etc. And then we all know very well in California that um, weedy areas that the weeds have not been managed can be a fire hazard, um, either in natural areas or even in our urban um, urban areas. And sometimes it's a little bit of both. Um, my kids are going back to school, um, going back to 
school on campus finally and the principal told me yesterday that it was really weedy and it both looked bad for the families coming back you know the campus looked bad but also there is going to be some recess and he didn't want the weeds to be a tripping hazard so you know sometimes it's a multitude of of all of these things um weeds that are left to flower can attract bees and while we want to you know um have healthy pollinators sometimes in a park or recreation area or a school you have folks that um, have uh, bee allergies um, some plants actually can um, uh, produce um, you know pollen and have other um, issues that can cause allergic reactions and so we want to try and keep any of these potential allergens and maybe bees um, uh, low and so that's one reason to keep our, our weeds down and then um, tall weeds can be a safety concern, yes, but also can be harborage for uh, wildlife like rodents and um, and also uh, be harborage for homeless encampments. And uh, rodents or other kinds of wildlife can carry diseases, can be nuisance pests, can be economic pests. And so, you know, these are all reasons why weed control may be important in whatever situation you are working in or we are residing in. So <clears throat> we all know about IPM for weeds, right? This group especially, you've been talking about IPM, um, you know, every, every meeting you have. And we do know that there are many ways to control weeds. Um, and I'm not going to go into anything here today except for the, the organic herbicides and other herbicides. Um, that I'll talk about, but we know that good sanitation and um, mowing and using flame weeders and, and these newer steam weeders and other kinds of uh, mechanical control or, or non-chemical control um, is part of our IPM program, but also part of IPM can be chemical control, and that's why we want to talk about these, these organic and lesser toxic um, alternatives to, to glyphosate and some of the conventional herbicides that have been out on the market for a while. So when I started doing these these studies um, uh, around 2018, um, I was looking for what other studies have been done with uh, these organic herbicides and, and what's been published. And I didn't find a whole lot. Um, there's been a lot of, of um, research done on organic herbicides and other herbicides in agriculture, but not quite as much published um, for for landscape and, and garden um, uses and turf. So it really became apparent that we needed to do more research to sort of catch up with the practices that we know um, many uh, school districts and municipalities have been using these, these um, alternative herbicides, but we don't have a, a lot of data on uh, how well they work and in what conditions and so forth. And so um, we started doing more research and uh, something that I'm doing right now is is um, trying to get out our results and uh, the information that I'll share today uh, with you. Um, my colleague Cheryl Willen, who I know has come in and spoken for this group, um, she's done um, a lot of tests on these, these herb, uh, organic herbicides in California and uh, she has since retired, so now I am picking up that that mantle best I can. Uh, so here is just some some labels uh, for some of the products that are in the trials that I'll share with you today. Um, these organic and lesser toxic herbicides are um, their plant oils. Uh, some of them are pesticidal uh, soaps, herbicidal soaps. Many come from natural resources. Um, many of them are organic, like I will show you. I have a chart um, to show you which ones are organically acceptable and which ones are not. So they are not all organically acceptable, even if some of the active ingredients are derived from natural sources. And that's important to know um, for your IPM plan. If, if your plan specifies organic only, um, it's important to know which ones are and are not organically acceptable. So we do know um, some things about these um, organic herbicides on, on how they work the best. Um, so one important consideration that I get asked all the time, are they pre-emergent? Do they have pre-emergence um, um, 
uh, efficacy. They do not. All of these organic herbicides that I'm going to talk about are post emergence. So you have to spray them on the growing plant or weed for them to to work at all. Uh, they are post emergence. They are non selective. Um, most of of the products I'll show you, um, meaning they 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 don't care what plant um, you spray them on. And so it's important for any kind of application around desirable plants because they will damage um, the desirable plants and they work by contact. And so good spray coverage is going to be essential. Um, uh, smaller weeds are gonna be uh, better controlled than um, more mature, tall weeds in very weedy areas. We do know that these products work best on clear, sunny days and in warmer temperatures. So warmer about um, 80 degrees um, uh, Fahrenheit or above. Um, but we also do know that we don't always spray the herbicides in these ideal conditions. And so one of the things that I'm doing is looking at um, using these herbicides in some of the um, non-ideal conditions that I'm, I'm showing you here. Um, some of the organic surfactants um, may also improve uh, weed control. And um, as you'll see, repeat applications um, are going to be needed for weedy areas or for plants that um, will sort of recover and regrow after the initial application. All right, so those are some of the things we know and and we're we're working in in um, looking at different trials for um, different situations. So I started um, doing a couple trials in 2019 and I'm going to show you the preliminary results. All of my results, I just want to say, are preliminary. Um, we have been busy sort of doing all, all these things and I, I want to show you the results from what we see now but I definitely want to look at outliers and, and other conditions for these sites. So um, in 2019, I did two trials um, in two different locations, and here are the list of the products and the active ingredients um, for those products. And as you can see, most of, of the products are um, organically acceptable, but some are not. Um, some that you might even think were organically acceptable are not. And then the signal word, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and so you'll see this chart several times um, and it's a little different for different trials. Sometimes we took one out and put a different one in. And then this is the only slide where I'm going to mention Weed Slayer. I know that Chris sent out um, the stop use um, announcement uh, late last year when it was discovered that Weed Slayer was contaminated with a conventional um, herbicide active ingredient or two. Um, it was um, uh, something that many organic producers and, and probably some of yourselves used. We included it in one of our trials, but I removed the data since it's um, not valid. Um, and so I'll talk about some of these as as we go along. And you can see in in here that I have glyphosate um, and uh, glufosinate. Um, glyphosate was used in in one trial just as a comparison, and glufosinate sort of as well. All right. So efficacy is what everybody wants to know. And again, preliminary data only. So our first study in 2019, um, and I. I say we, I've been working with um, John Ron Caroni, who some of you may know. He is a, a long uh, UC Cooperative Extension weed scientist, and he has recently retired. So um, he's been helping me out in all things uh, weeds and herbicides. So we had this lovely site in the Sacramento Delta region um, in uh, early 2019 and um, it was a mix of grasses and some very common weeds and you can see sort of the density of, of some of the weeds here um, a lot of dandelion and bristly ox tongue and then a mix of different fescues and a lot of clover um, and so we had this plot for only a short time and um, we know as i said that these um, organic herbicides work best in clear sunny warm conditions well february and march in this area is not necessarily um, warm, but it was very clear, um, no shade, um, a lot of good sun, some cloudy days. 
um, but we decided, you know, people are using herbicides in uh, months that aren't very warm. And so let's see how some of these uh, products work in these conditions that are not ideal. So we had um, small plots. Um, we had five by 10 foot plots um, and we had a, a random block design with 12 plots per replication and four replications. Um, our equipment at the time was a three nozzle boom. We had fat flan, flat fan nozzles and we uh, put out the product at 100 gallons per acre. And there's the low temperature as I mentioned already. At this, tri uh, at this particular trial, we tried out um, uh, these products. We did not use um, uh, glyphosate for this one. Um, this is the only trial so far we have used the 20% acetic acid, and I'll get into why we didn't use it at the other trial in a moment. Um, and then here are the rates. We followed the label, recommended label rates for all of these, these products. Um, the one product that I will talk about here is Fiesta. It is a non, excuse me, it is a selective herbicide. It is a broadleaf only selective herbicide. It is not organically acceptable, um, but it is one that we wanted to have a look at for its efficacy uh, in not damaging the grasses, but controlling the, the broadleaves. And, um, and one different thing here is we, uh, tried out suppress and suppress plus its acidifier, which is recommended to use on the label just to compare um, with and without. And for all of the trials, we had a control where we didn't spray that plot at all. So we rated the um, the phytotoxicity, the plant damage on a zero to 10 visual scale. Zero being no damage was seen, so no um, burning or spots or uh, dead plants and 10 being completely dead plant. Um, and so these visual ratings, which we did um, several days after treatment, so DAT, days after treatment, DOT is the day of treatment, um, where we just said everything's at zero. Um, and we then sprayed, the next day we came back and then um, onward for a couple of weeks. So you can see that at one day after treatment, some of the products actually did cause um, phytotoxicity or damage to the plant material. And so one thing about these contact herbicides is that they, they do work on contact and they burn the plant material. So uh, some of the, the materials, you can see them actually uh, working on the plant even an hour after you spray it. So um, that can be something desirable. We know with glyphosate and some of the other products that it might take, you know, a, a week or two for you to see any damage. Um, but many of these burn down um, products work almost immediately. So at four days after treatment is where we saw sort of the highest um, damage activity. Um, and you can see my, my uh, uh, legend over to the side. Uh, at this particular site, the um, the acetic acid, the 20% vinegar, seemed to work uh, the best on grasses, and then it was all kind of you know a little bit of of damage, um, but none really got very high. The finale, which is the glufosinate, which is not organic, um, it it acts similar similar but different to glyphosate in that it takes a few days to a week for you to start seeing any damage results. And we did not have this plot for very long. So we, um, after two weeks, we um, we moved on. But what would probably need to happen, and you'll see it on my other slides, is that we would need to um, do a second treatment um, after two or three weeks in order to have sustained weed control. Uh, same thing for the broad leaves. Um, we, um, we rated the, the broad leaves on the same phytotoxicity zero to 10 visual scale. And we saw that one day after treatment, a number of these products worked, um, uh, you know, caused phytotoxicity um, very quickly. And at four days, we still saw some. And, um, and same thing with the glufosinate, the finale, it took, um, you know, about a week or so before we started seeing activity. 
The difference between the grasses and the broadleaves is that product I mentioned, Fiesta, which is iron AGDTA. There's there's other products that have that active ingredient. Iron X is a popular one. Um, I think there's another product as well. But Fiesta um, is a, uh, a broadleaf only selective herbicide and it uh, took a couple days, but then we saw at this site for this trial, we saw good phytotoxicity and had we rated past uh, two weeks, um, we probably would have seen sustained uh, control of the broadleaves. In some cases, um, some of the broadleaf plants were completely killed and, and did not recover. But for, for many of these, since they are, um, these are contact herbicides, the plants regrow from the root. And so the, the, material, the plant material that was sprayed, of course, gets damaged or killed but then the plant recovers from, from the growing point in the soil. Uh, we rated clover specifically because there were a lot of, of clover plants at this site. And similar to the other broadleaves, um, we saw initial damage. And then after about two weeks, the clover plant started to recover, except for the glufosinate product here. And you can see the Fiesta um, uh, starting to, to work after a little while. So that was our first trial in um, cooler conditions in Sacramento. We did another trial at Sacramento State University later in 2019 um, in August and September. And for those of you who know the Sacramento area, it is much warmer um, in the summer. Um, and this site had a mix of um, weedy grasses like Dallas grass, Bermuda grass, crab grass, had a lot of sedge, um, wild strawberry, plantain, uh, clovers, it's a, it's a good mix of weeds. Um, but what's interesting about this site and why we um, really wanted to do our trials on the site is you can see here is, here is the, the site. It's covered with a canopy of trees. And so um, it is in the shade largely. It's a nice weedy area, but this is what it looks like for a good portion of the day. You do have some places in the back here that get um, later afternoon sun, but some of the, the area in the middle is, is in shade nearly all day. And so again, these products work best in um, sunny conditions, but we do have weed control we have to do in the shade too. So looking at how these are working in the shade. And this plot, um, this site, uh, we couldn't do much uh, weed um, research in 2020 because of the pandemic, but we've started um, uh, another trial this year and I'll, I'll show those uh, results too. So nearly the same products um, and I'll show you the, the, the chart in a second. Um, same size plots, same kind of reps. We did reduce our gallons per acre because we didn't need the same kind of output. And again, much higher temperatures at this place. Uh, so for this site, we decided to use um, the Sacramento State groundskeepers. Um, they've been using Ranger Pro, so we threw in um, a glyphosate product and to compare with the glufosinate, the finale. Um, and we added, uh, what did we add here? I'm forgetting what we added. I think it was just that. We removed from Sacramento State. Oh, this is where we added the the um, weed slayer, and that's why it's missing because we I removed the data. Um, but we we removed the 20% acetic acid from this trial, partly because of the uh, potential for um, any drift um, while we are spraying. And um, the 20% acetic acid has a danger signal word, which I'll get into but we had concerns about Sacramento State um, feasibly using that product um, while students, staff, and other bystanders are around. And this was in the middle of a parking lot, so um, we did have uh, bystanders, so we, we just didn't use it at this, at this uh, trial. So we did have this plot for longer, so we were able to do um, more than one treatment. Um, so this shows um, several months uh, and and two treatments. So uh, same phytotoxicity rating scale, zero to 10. Um, here is our um, day of treatment. And again, at one day after treatment, we saw some immediate phytotoxicity of the plants. And then after a week and about two weeks, we start seeing the plants recover. 
So at about three weeks, we did a second treatment. And so the second treatment we saw again, um, our, our phytotoxicity numbers climb, and then we just let that go for um, a, several weeks, uh, another month or so. And at around um, 50 days uh, from our initial treatment, uh, most of the plants started to regrow and recover and it, it kind of looked like we didn't spray. I removed from these um, these charts the glufosinate and the glyphosate because they throw off my spidery lines here and we know how those products work because you know many of, of, of us have been using them for a while. Uh, broad leaves the same thing we saw initial burn down and and then after a couple of weeks um, the plants started to regrow so we did the second treatment and at about um, you know 50 days um, the plants had almost completely um, regrown from from the soil so here's a comparison of the glyphosate and glufosinate um, that i had removed from those other ones um, because i didn't want them to skew the the visuals of the other um, um, products, we did not do a second treatment for glyphosate and glufosinate. Um, these require um, less frequent application. And so we could have um, did another treatment um, around, uh, you know, three weeks or, or even longer, but we decided not to for these. And this is what the plot looked like so that you can get a, a visual sense of, of the, the burn down. So here is uh, the day of or the day before we treated. So lots of grass and you know, you, you see some of the Bermuda grass was a little uh, white, but this is one day after treatment. And this is with the final San O, which is the um, ammoniated SOPA fatty acid. Um, and so this is what some of the burn down plots did look like is one day you saw some really good immediate um, uh, phytotoxicity and then at three days, you still see, um, you know, that that the plants are, are good and dead. Um, and then at seven days, you can see some of the, the grass is starting to regrow. And at 13 days, um, so almost two weeks, you can see the dandelion starting to regrow, the grass starting to regrow. And then at about three weeks, you can you can see that there's still um, um, regrowth happening. And then this was one day after the second treatment that you can see good good control. So so really it's just, you know, what weeds do you have? What are the conditions? And, you know, there needs to be um, uh, frequent applications if the weeds um, recover. I have kids learning at home, so sorry for the background noise. All right, so these are the new trials that we are currently doing right now. So this is like I entered the data last night for for um, you guys to see today. Um, we have the Sacramento State uh, campus uh, area again, um, almost the same materials. We've added a couple more. We reduced the size of our plots. Um, I got a new um, spray uh, boom equipment where we have four nozzles um, and so uh, just for size. Again, <clears throat> 12 plots per rep. Oh, excuse me, no, we did 10 at Sacramento State, sorry. Um, and then the temperature, so right around now, um, we've had, you know, the the range of temperatures, but some really cold mornings and warmer afternoons. So the products that we used here, again, some of the same ones that, that I've shown you. And we added to this weed rot and fireworks. Some of you may be familiar with these. Um, I had a call from a school district who asked about weed rot and I didn't know about it. So, you know, I take feedback that I get from, from folks like you and, and see if there's a product that is being used out there um, that folks want to know about. And if I can, I will work it into these trials. Uh, fireworks has this uh, very um, similar um, percentage of active ingredients to suppress um, and it's uh, a newer product that I heard about so I wanted to do just a comparison and again most of these are organic organically acceptable um, scythe is not uh, I did not use Fiesta at this site just because I used these um, I added these other two and we also have a control here 
So what we're seeing, um, and I, um, again, this is preliminary. It's, um, I've just put in the data. I have not analyzed everything yet, but we did our first treatment on February 25th. Uh, same rating scale, same everything. Uh, initial burn down was good. And then after about three weeks, um, we decided we needed to retreat. So we did, and this is where we're at now. So we'll probably do um, one more rating and I expect to find that the plants have started to recover and we're not seeing as much phytotoxicity. Um, and so that's for the grasses. And for the broad leaves, again, um, initial, and then they they nearly completely regrow by about two and a half, three weeks. And um, we didn't see as good of control for our second treatment. Um, but again, I need to go and look at the data and see um, what's happening. Um, and uh, we're probably going to wait a little bit to respray. Um, the area is um, not being irrigated right now, and there's some dry spots, and I just want to make sure that that's not throwing off our, our results. So with that, so those are preliminary efficacy. There are considerations to using some of these um, these products in that, you know, we know how, how glyphosate and some of the conventional um, herbicides work. Uh, glyphosate is a systemic product where these um, organic and and um, other alternative products work on contact. And so when something works on contact, it might work faster, whereas we have to wait for glyphosate. So, you know, it might be um, something desirable to have, you know, really fast um, uh, phytotoxicity and weed control. Um, the signal words I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit, but the uh, signal words um, do vary, as, as you've seen on the, the tables already. Um, and the personal protective equipment that you need to wear will also uh, be determined by the signal word and the label, and that's really important, um, and I'll get into that. Um, I already mentioned how quickly you might see damage. But one other important consideration, and you probably know this, is that some of these products, um, they're really uh, smelly. So some of them, um, they have a nice kind of orangey lemony scent and others smell like Christmas for the first 10 minutes and then it's, it's overwhelming. The cinnamon oils and the clove oils. And so odor is a consideration that might be an issue when you're using these products in public areas or on school campuses. And, um, you know, it, it may be very um, off-putting for some people. So, so that is a consideration. Um, as I mentioned, uh, they need to be resprayed um, potentially more frequently than some of the conventional products that um, you used to use or, or still do use. And that is a concern for uh, labor cost and also cost of the product. And I, I have a chart later that that compares the cost of some of these products. So let's talk about signal words. Um, and um, I'm sure you all know this, but it's good to have a reminder of what signal words mean and and what does organic mean. So um, whether something is organic, organically acceptable or not, does not mean it is totally benign and totally safe. Organic, it just meets certain um, national organic standards on whether something is um, uh, developed and um, synthesized organically or, or made organically. Um, but signal words indicate the acute toxicity of a pesticide to humans. So signal words are going to tell us how immediately toxic something is to us when we are applying it. It does not have anything to do with long-term uh, chronic effects such as cancer or other kinds of issues. Signal words are telling us immediate damage that might be caused when we're um, applying mixing using being exposed to a pesticide product. So the way we are exposed is on our skin, right? Getting it on our skin somewhere, uh, ingesting it either accidentally or on purpose, hopefully it's accidental, um, breathing in vapors um, through our lungs or splashing into our eyes. And so um, these are the routes of exposure that will um, 
uh, be the measures of how uh, toxic a product is to humans. So the less toxic, the lower toxicity rating is caution, um, meaning something is is lower toxicity and it it you need you know a certain amount to you know um, infinity amounts to for something to be relatively non-toxic. Um, the next signal word up in in um, in uh, toxicity is the the warning, the signal word warning, which means something is moderately toxic at slightly lower doses. And then we have the danger signal word, which means that something is highly hazardous um, and the dose really depends on the, the product. And then there's danger poison. Uh, I don't think we have a lot of pesticide products for non-agricultural use that is danger poison. Um, there may be one or two, but um, we do see caution warning and danger the most. But danger poison, it just takes a drop to a teaspoon of something to be um, poisonous or even fatal. Uh, and so when you look at the pesticide labels, you're going to see the signal word. And so for something like the 20% uh, acetic acid, the 20% vinegars, um, those do have a danger signal word. And as I mentioned um, at the Sacramento State, um, having people walking by while we're spraying or even, you know, walking because people did walk through that plot uh, until we roped it off. Uh, we just did not want to have any potential exposure and um, they did not think that these vinegar products would be appropriate uh, for them to use as part of their IPM plan. Um, and so we will continue to look at the acetic acid, but um, my my tech who does the spraying for me, he has a lot of facial hair and that's um, an issue with his PPE that he can't he can't spray this product. Uh, so uh, just to show you another label, um, the suppress so has a, a warning. So you're going to always find the signal word on the front of the label and then the label will discuss the personal protective equipment that is needed. So there are the minimum California uh, uh, regulations for the minimum PPE that you need, but the label may also specify that you need to wear um, additional um, personal protective equipment. And that's important that you both read the label, follow the label, and whichever is the most strict is what you need to follow, whether it's the California minimum or or the label. And so in some cases you need to wear coveralls, whether that's a Tyvek or another kind of coverall material um, over your long sleeve um, pants and and um, and shirt. And so where you're going to be applying this material, if you need to wear um, you know, full protective equipment, what does that look like to the bystanders and the public? You know, what's the perception? What are you spraying in my park that my kids are gonna be exposed to? So you just need to consider this when considering some of these materials. So always having good eyewear to reduce the um, exposure to your eyes, um, proper proper eye equipment, chemical resistant gloves, and there are many different um, categories of chemical resistant gloves. Um, and so making sure you've got the right ones, um, an approved uh, NIOSH approved respirator. And for some of these, you may need to have uh, different kinds of respirators and be fit tested for them. And as I mentioned, um, for some of these products, especially the danger poison um, and some of the warnings, you may need coveralls as well. And so we just wanna make sure that when you are applying these materials, just because they're organically acceptable does not mean no PPE is needed. You always need to protect yourself so that you reduce your exposure and follow the label because that's what the label will say. Um, and so here's this chart again, um, but we uh, we want to consider right the costs of these these products and the fact that they need to be reapplied perhaps more frequently than some of the conventional products. So I did a, a comparison of of costs in 2019, except for weed rot. Um, I tried to look that up last night and I could only find one one price, but all of these other prices are from 2019. So I, I do need to update this slide, but you can see that um, at the two and a half gallon um, uh, 
jug and with the rate, the label rate that we applied these at, we did a comparison or a calculation of the price per thousand square feet. And you can see there's a really big range. Uh, fireworks is, sorry, ignore this fireworks. That's not, that's not, oops, that's not correct. So just ignore that. Um, and so that's that's not correct, but the acetic acid is correct in that you you apply it at full rate. You don't dilute it. And so it's thirty four dollars per thousand square feet where something like Avenger or um, Finale. Uh, sorry, that's the glufosinate uh, suppress is about five dollars. And so there is a range. Um, the prices may um, may be less than they were in 2019. But this is also something to consider when using um, uh, the organic herbicides as there may be a higher labor cost and material cost. So what is next <clears throat> is that we're going to continue these trials. So the Sacramento State trial, um, I think we're done for um, right now. We need to irrigate and mow and wait for some growth and then we'll do another round of trials. I have a new trial in um, the Sacramento Delta area, um, and I don't have those results to show because we have we had some problems. Um, but we're going to be testing um, these products, any other products that um, uh, we might be able to work in. And we get asked all the time about um, tank mixes, and we have not tried any tank mixes yet. I still want to try these products just alone, um, so that we can get some more data and we will be uh, probably working in some tank mixes. And as I mentioned, we do want to try these out in different um, temperature conditions in uh, different um, other weather conditions, uh, different weeds. In the Sacramento trial, we have all of those those weeds that I mentioned. We are rating how um, how phytotoxic um, we see for the different weeds. I didn't present that today, but we're rating clovers separately from dandelions, separately from from the mallow, um, and we'll be um, analyzing those results. And one thing I'm doing right now is is giving this talk a lot and sharing the results that we do have, and I will continue to to do that and um, keep you updated. Uh, my colleague and I, Maggie Ryder, um, who has since left the University of California for another state. Um, we did publish a uh, paper with our methods and results in the CAPCA Advisor um, magazine uh, last year. Um, and so those were from the Sacramento State um, uh, trials. And um, we have at the University of California IPM program, we have a green bulletin e-newsletter that has um, articles for landscape pest management professionals and structural pest management professionals. And in this newsletter, we talk about um, weed control and various landscape pest issues. But in particular, we wrote about um, glyphosate and PPE uh, uh, last year, two years ago. So you can subscribe to this e-newsletter. Um, it comes out three times a year. You can find all the articles on the UCIPM website. Um, you can scan this QR code to subscribe to it, and I promise we won't spam you. I send out most of the, the communication. And I don't have time to spam you. Um, uh, but if you want to just look at the e-newsletter before you subscribe, you can search in a browser for UCIPM Green Bulletin, and you can find all the past articles. We've been um, publishing this newsletter for uh, 10 years now, um, and it's written by other UC experts, um, and this is where we will publish some results. So I'm writing the article up on these preliminary results for my um, herbicide trials that will come out in the next Green Bulletin, which should be out in May. Um, so I always have uh, a lot of questions about things, and there's my contact information. Um, I can take questions now, and then Chris, here's the slide for the evaluation and demographics, but it's up to you whether we want to do questions now or do this now. Oh, let's, I, I think let's go ahead with questions. That sounds okay. good. Thank, thank you so much, Carrie.